Hi, hello, I am the Cyber Reef Guru. Thank you so much for watching. Today is part four of my CNC 101 video series where we are going to cover tool paths. So if you have not already watched parts one, two, and three, I do encourage you to do so. Part one was the introduction to digital manufacturing where we cover the CAD CAM process end to end. Part two is where I walk through the machine. I talk about the different machine configurations, which I will discuss later in this video as well. And then part three is where I talk about the bits that you can use to reproduce your products in this subtractive manufacturing process. So tool paths are the operations that the machine engages in to actually create the product. So you create tool paths in your CAM software and you configure your tool paths to reproduce your model based on the different bits that you are using. And so you need to customize your tool paths to your bits and to your machine and to the material you're cutting to get optimum results. Today we're going to be covering two fundamental tool paths and that is a profile tool path, sometimes called a contour tool path and a pocketing tool path. These are the two most fundamental tool paths you will use and the two that you will use most frequently. All other tool paths, generally speaking, boil down to some variant of either a pocket or a profile tool path. Before getting into the actual tool paths, I do want to really quickly cover the difference between 2D milling and 3D milling. Now, 2D milling is sometimes called 2.5D milling, and the reason it is called that, generally speaking, when you're doing 2D milling, is you are moving the machine around in the X and the Y coordinate system, and only varying the Z height occasionally. So that is why it's called 2D milling, occasionally 2.5D milling, because you are using that Z height, but you're not changing it constantly. By contrast, 3D milling is where you are varying the X, Y, and Z heights simultaneously to create the patterns to reproduce your products. And so sometimes it gets confusing what the difference between 2D milling and 3D milling might be, especially with something like engraving, where engraving you're generally varying that Z height on a continuous basis as you're moving in the X and the Y direction. But 3D milling does have a lot of additional properties that you need to worry about as you constrain your work material and your machine to certain types of operations. So in this video, I will be covering 2D or 2.5D milling exclusively. I will not dive into 3D milling operations. So if you do have some interest in that, please leave your comments down below and we'll see if we can make a video to support that. All right, now it's time. Let's go ahead and cut over to Fusion 360 and let me show you the design I came up for this video and the different tool paths. Now I am going to do just a high level overview of the tool paths. So if you're interested in a deep dive into some of the details of these tool paths, again, please leave your comments down below and we'll see if we can make that video. All right, let's go ahead and cut over to Fusion 360. Well, here we are in Fusion 360 and what you see in front of you is the design I have created for this video. So what you have here in front of you is a pocket or a recess in this particular body. And then here we have an inlay, which is a body that is sunken into the actual stock itself. And then on the bottom here, we have some text that I did an extrude on that we can use the engrave tool for. So let's go ahead and start the discussion by talking about the pocketing operation. So we're going to cut over to the manufacturing workspace, sometimes called the CAM workspace, and talk about the tool paths that I generated for this pocket. I'm going to start by talking about the pocket operations in Fusion 360 and then move over to the profile operations and finish up with an engraving operation. As you can see here, I have a couple different operations that I have created in Fusion 360. Now, I always name my operations, starting with the type of operation and then the bit that I use for the operation. Occasionally, I will add additional information to the name. You can name it whatever you want, but I find this useful because I know immediately, for example, that I have a pocket here that is with a 1 8 inch end mill versus a pocket here, which is at a quarter inch end mill. Let's start the discussion here by looking at the various options in the pocketing operation for Fusion 360. So all of Fusion's cam operations, generally speaking, have a similar layout. You'll see these various tabs across the top and various options here across the bottom. And all of the 
2D and 3D cam operations start with the tool. Here we have selected that 1 8 inch end mill that I mentioned earlier. You can set the spindle speed and you can set the feed rate. That is the rate in which the machine moves while it's cutting the operation. And then you can also set a variety of other feed rates in Fusion 360. Most of the other simplified cam tools do not offer these options, but in Fusion you do have them. Now, I do have a tendency just to set them all to my feed rate, except for the plunge rate. That simplifies things a little bit. I have not seen any negative consequences in any of the operations I've done in wood. However, if you are cutting in aluminum or metal, you probably do want to decrease your lead in, lead out, and maybe your ramp feed rate to be a little bit lower than your cutting rate to ease into that material a little bit slower. The next tab you'll run across is the geometry tab. This is where you actually tell Fusion 360 what you want to cut. In this case, we have selected this pocket or the recessed area. One option on the screen that I do find useful is rest machining. So if you want to use a larger bit to remove most of your material and then switch to a smaller bit to remove what is left over, this is where you would use rest machining. So in the second operation with the smaller bit, you check rest machining, you tell it what the size of the larger bit was, and then Fusion 360 will calculate the difference and only remove the material that is left after using the bigger bit. So it's very useful if you want to use a large bit like for this pocket and then come in with a smaller bit to remove the areas that are left over, say in the corners or some other geometry that you might have. The next area in Fusion 360 is where you set all the heights. The height that is most important on this particular screen is the bottom height. That is the height in which the bit will stop cutting. The next area you want to focus in on is the top height. Now I generally set my top height to the stock height no matter what height I am cutting at and then I use that as a reference surface for all of the other heights. In this case I have selected contours as the bottom height. Sometimes I do set the bottom height as either the stock top minus some offset or the bottom stock minus plus or minus some offsite. You have many options in here in setting your bottom height, um, but sticking with the stock top as a reference point, I know exactly where I'm starting from in the cut because I zero at the stock top of all of my operations. For the other heights in Fusion 360, I generally just set them to the same value. They are usually offsets from one another. So for the retract height, this is the height that the machine will move up to while it's going to do some rapid operations. I do 0.1 inches from the clearance height. The clearance height is the height that the machine will move to when it's doing a rapid and it wants to avoid some objects say like clamps, for example. And the feed height is where the machine will move to while it's moving around inside an operation. The default for Fusion 360 for these various heights come in different forms. I generally just sent them to 0.1 inches for all of them. That works pretty well for me and I have not found any reason to deviate from that. The next area for the pocket operation allows you to actually set up your different passes and whether or not you want to do multiple depths for your cut. Fusion 360 by default does not cut at multiple depths. It wants to take the entire cut in one depth. And for the hobbyist grade machines that we are generally using, you definitely want to take multiple depth cuts. And so the way you enable that in Fusion 360 is by checking this box right here and then setting the step down distance. The step down distance is the amount of material that will be removed for every cut. In some of the other programs like Inventable, Easel, and Carbide Create, the step down distance is automatically set to some reasonable value for your machine. So that's just word of the wise if you're using Fusion 360 to make sure you select multiple depths and you set your step down distance. The last area I want to cover for a pocketing operation is the linking tab. That's where you can set various options for how the machine enters your material and leaves the material while you're doing your cutting. Generally, I leave most of these to the default value. I do, however, set my safe distance to a 0.05 inches for the rapid retract. I generally do not use lead in and lead out. If you are cutting in aluminum, you definitely want to do that. That'll ease the bit into your cut. For the ramp, like I mentioned earlier, I am using a helical ramp. There are a couple different ramp options here where you can plunge directly into your material straight down. This is the option you will see most frequently with easel or with carbide create. It'll just plunge straight down into your material. I prefer this helical ramp because it spins the bit around and eases it into the material so you don't have full contact 
with the cutter as you're plunging down into the material. I use somewhere between a two degree and a five degree ramp for my helix, depending on what sort of operation I'm doing and what kind of speeds I'm looking for. And I do set my clearance height here to 0.05 inches. That's where the bit starts entering into the helical mode, which is just above the work material. And I find that saves a little bit of extra time rather than spinning the bit around in air for no particular reason. All right, well, that was a rapid run through of the various options that I use in Fusion 360 for a pocketing operation. Now I'm gonna move over into the contour operation and show you some of the features in that particular operation in Fusion 360. I've hidden the base of the model that we are using and I am showing you just the inlay, which is this flower that I am going to do the contour operation on. As you can see in front of you, the tool path goes around the outside of this particular model. And that's what a contour operation is, is it follows some profile inside your model and creates an outline of your model. Now, in some of the CAD programs like Easel and Carbide Create, you do select whether you want to follow the inside or the outside or the center line of your model. Model. In Fusion 360, the contour will follow either the outside or the inside, depending on what you select in the editing parameters. So let me go ahead and open up the contour operation here and show you some of the different parameters that I set. You will notice right off the bat, as I mentioned earlier, that the contour operation setup screen looks nearly identical to the profile setup screen. The area that changes the most is the passes tabs, which we'll get to in just a minute. So for a contour, essentially use the same setup that I used for the profile, which is a 45 inch per minute cutting rate, as well as a 12,000 RPM in my spindle speed. In this case, I am using the 1 8 inch end mill as well. For the geometry tab here, I did select the outside of the flower here. Now this is where you can select the inside or the outside of a profile to cut by selecting this little red arrow right here. If you were to click this arrow, it would move the cut to the inside of the profile. If you have the arrow on the other side, it'll do the outside of the profile. So this is where it allows you to select exactly how you want to do your cut. One thing different about setting up the contour versus the profile, and that is the tabs area of this particular setup. And this is where you can establish tabs on your work holding material that keeps the material attached to the stock while you're cutting it. If you were to just route this out completely and not use some sort of tape or adhesive on the back, it would be free floating when you were done cutting and that would likely cause it to intersect with the router and either hit the router and destroy itself or fly out of the machine. So if you're not using some sort of glue or tape to hold your material down, then you definitely want to use tabs to make sure that it's attached to the stock when you're done doing the milling and then you can just simply break the tabs when you're done and remove your final piece from the stock when the operation is complete. The next tab is the heights and it is identical to the pocketing height tab. Once again, I set all of my heights to 0.1 inches, set my top height to my stock and set my bottom height to the contour in this case or whatever the depth is that I want to cut. The next area of the contour setup is the passes tab, and this is the one that is the most different from the pocketing setup. So real quickly, there's a lot of options here, and I don't want to dwell too much on all of them, but the things that you need to be most cognizant of while you're doing your setup is your finishing feed rate. This is the rate that you want to cut if you do have a finishing pass, which we'll talk about in just a minute. If you do want your bit to overlap a little bit, from where it plunged in versus where it leaves the material during the finishing pass, you can set that here. The next area to concern yourself with is the roughing passes. This is where you tell Fusion 360 that you want to remove most of your material using the feed rate you set in the first tab versus the finishing feed rate, which you set right here. So if you do want to do all your milling at the finishing feed rate, then simply do not select the roughing passes. If you do want to do a more rapid removal material and then come in and do a final finishing pass, then this is where you would want to select this. Just like the pocketing operation, Fusion does not by default take multiple passes, and so you do need to select the multiple passes option to do that with the contour operation. Once again here, I am cutting at 0.06 inches deep. That is about half the diameter of my cutting bit. And I do select finish only at final depth. That tells Fusion that you only want to run the finishing speed at the final cut 
depth, not anywhere else throughout the operation. If you do want to use your finishing speed at other points throughout your operation, then just uncheck that box. Now, one thing that I do also check is rough final. That's where Fusion will make a cut at the lowest depth at the roughing speed and then come in and then do the final finishing pass. The other option would be to not select the rough final and then Fusion would simply use your finishing feed rate at that final cut and your final depth. I like removing all of my material at the roughing speed and then come in and then do the final finishing pass just to clean up the walls at a full depth cut. The last tab for a contour setup is very similar to the pocketing setup. And again, once again, I set my safe distance at 0.05 inches. I have not used a lead in and lead out in this particular case, and I am still using a ramp. In this case, I am using a two degree ramp, which is a slightly less steep ramp than that five degree that I used for the previous cutting. Now, the difference here between a contour and a pocket is a ramp in a pocket is gonna spin in in that helical manner you selected via the drop down versus a ramp for a contour is going to slowly ramp in at an angle from top to the first cutting depth. So that was a quick run through of the contour operation in Fusion 360. And next I'm gonna go ahead and cut over to the engraving operation. So here you have the engraving options pulled up and the first thing you'll notice, it is nearly identical to the contour and the pocketing operation of Fusion 360. In this case, I have chosen a one half inch 60 degree V cutter for my engraving operation. I do run my V cutter a little bit slower than I do my normal end mills. That seems to provide better results to me. However, your mileage may vary. The geometry tab for the engraving operation is similar to all the rest of the operations we've covered so far. One thing to note about engraving operations in Fusion 360 is you want to set your contour to the top of your material. If you set it to the bottom, then Fusion is gonna try and take the tip of your bit and get it all the way down to that bottom value. That means, however, that it is likely not going to observe the contour on the top because it is trying to meet the contour on the bottom, which will make the top wider than you perhaps want it to be. And I will show you that in just a minute. The next tab in the engraving operations in Fusion 360 is the height tab. It is identical to all the other ones. Relative to the bottom height here, I do let Fusion calculate the offset distance here and I do not change it. I have changed it before in the past and it doesn't really seem to produce the outcome that I want. The key thing about engraving in Fusion is that you bound the engraving operation to the profile on the top and then the height is whatever height you end up getting based on the angle of your cutter. So if you're using a very broad cutter like a 90 degree, you will not get as deep. If you're using a very shallow cutter like a 22 and a half degree, then you will end up cutting deeper than you would with something like a 90 or a 60 degree V bit. The next tab is the passes tab in Fusion 360. And this is an area where I generally do not make any changes. I just accept the defaults. Now I do not cut in multiple depths with engraving operations because usually I'm not cutting that deep. So the single cut depth seems to work well for me, especially because I'm using a slower feed rate. The final tab in Fusion 364 engraving is the linking tab. And you can see, once again, it is much more simplified than some of the other tabs. And here, again, I just accept all of the defaults. I generally do not change any of these unless I find a particular reason to change the maximum stay down for some reason or the keep the tool down option. So overall, engraving in Fusion 360 has a lot more simplified setup than contouring or pocketing in Fusion 360 and generally produces good results with the defaults that you get kind of out of the box. One of the features of Fusion 360 is it allows you to simulate your CAM tool pass before you post process them and send them to the machine. And I find this very valuable and I highly recommend it. You definitely wanna take a look at what the machine thinks it's going to do with its tool pass before you export it and you try to operate it on your machine. So if you are using a CAD program where you cannot do a simulation, I highly recommend you get a third party piece of software to do so. There are many out there on the internet and I will leave a link down below for some of the ones that I have found useful in the past. Let's select the engraving operation and let me show you the difference between selecting the top contour and the bottom contour in Fusion 360. So here we have the bottom selected and I'm gonna select the little icon that says simulate and I am going to zoom out a little bit. 
Here are all the different operations for Simulate. I will tell you the statistics tab is very useful. The machining time here should be relatively close to how long it would take on your machine. Now I will tell you it does not account for acceleration and deceleration of the machine. So this machining time will generally be your lower bound. It should not ever be faster than this when you're doing your actual cutting, but it may be depending on what your acceleration and deceleration settings are. So. In this case, I do have transparency turned on. You can turn it off, which we will do for this operation. Down here at the bottom, you have the little play buttons. This, you can speed forward and speed backwards into your cut operations. And you do have the option, if you have multiple operations selected, to speed through one entire operation and jump from operation to operation for your simulation. In this case, we're just gonna jump to the end of the one operation we have selected, and I'll show you what we got. Let's go ahead and turn the model off. And you can see here, although it does follow the profile that was selected, you can see that it absolutely blows out the text. I'll turn the model back on and you can see where it is actually V-carved. The tan area in this case is the model and the green area is the stock that is left. And so you can see that it actually carved significantly beyond that top profile. And so let's go ahead and close this and I will show you the top engraving here. Jump to the end and you will see the top, once we go to the end of the simulation, you can't tell the difference between the model and the stock. That's because Fusion 360 is observing the width of this contour on the top. I'll turn the model off here, you know, zoom in a little bit, you can see. You can see that what Fusion has done, it has not gone nearly as deep because you told it to only use the top profile. So it's only V cutting down to the depth where it hits the top profile sides on the left and the right. And so it creates a really shallow cut, but an exceptional engraving on the top when you select the top profile. There are times where you might want to select the bottom profile for some reason, but if you are engraving text, generally just select the top profile and you will get the outcome that you're looking for in Fusion 360. If you are doing a lot of V-carving or a lot of engraving and you want to use your machine for say inlays and get really fine details in your inlays, then I would tell you that Fusion 360 is probably not the software package for you. The engraving operations are very limited and they're very confusing and many times you select options and it just simply doesn't do what you think that it should do. So in that case, I would recommend that you would get something like the Vetric Aspire software or Carveco who have support for engraving much greater than what Fusion 360 does. However, those are generally CAM only solutions. You can do some drawing in them. You cannot do 3D modeling like you can in Fusion 360. But if you want to do your design in Fusion 360, for example, export it and import it into something like vCarve or Carveco, then that is an option as well. And that'll get you those greater vCarving features from those two pieces of software while still maintaining your modeling ability in Fusion 360. Well, that was the video. I hoped you enjoyed it. So I did go through all of the options of the contour and the pocketing operations and engraving operations in Fusion 360. It was super fast, I know, and it was a high level introduction. So if you do want a more detailed, in-depth discussion around some of these options, please leave your comments down below and we can make that video for you. All right, thank you so much for getting this far. Thank you so much for watching. If you like the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. If you did not like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up anyway, but leave your comments down below and we will make future videos better. If you're not already following me on Instagram, please consider doing so. That's where I post pictures of projects like this that become future videos. If you have not already subscribed, please consider doing so. Ringing that bell, very important these days. And don't forget to be inspired. And the two that you will move Next. Yes. Okay. Cross. <clears throat> Not crossover. Step over. By updating our parameters in terms of feed rate, depth of cut, and by updating our parameters in terms of feed rate, my God.
by updating our parameters in terms of feed rate, depth of cut, and step over, you can achieve much better results with a relatively small change in your operation. So again, same size pocket, different size bit, different parameters, and we went from 14 minutes down to three minutes for our cut. Was I talking? No. What? I can't find my water bottle. Did I leave it down here? No. Uh, I didn't hear you talking. Still recording. Yeah. Get out. The simulation for the adaptive cut can show similar results as 